Welcome to the webinar Talking Numbers Scaling Impact Practices, organized by EBPA in partnership with the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment, the GSG, and all the members of the European Data Harmonization Consortium. My name is Gianluca Gaggiotti. I'm Knowledge Manager at EBPA, and I'm very happy to be co moderating this webinar with my sparring partner, Cristina Tora, who is Chief Market Development Officer at the GSG. We are very happy and we have a great pleasure to be joined here by six experienced speakers who represent six different European countries and impact investing markets uh, in Europe. I will briefly present them in alphabetical order without going in depth into, into all the bios because you'll have the chance to hear from them later on during the webinar. So we have Filippo Montesi from Social Impact Agenda per Italia, which comes from Italy and is representing Italy in the consortium today. There is Frederick Jan van den Bosch Impact Finance, uh, from Impact Finance Belgium, so uh, representing Belgium. There's, we have a pleasure to have here and welcome to Johannes Weber, who works for the Bundes Initiative Impact Investing uh, in Germany. We have the pleasure of having uh, Laura West, uh, Westermuse Shibra, but she's not here yet. She will join us soon and she joins from the Netherlands now. Uh, welcome to Marta Gonzalez Avian from Spain Nab, so representing Spain. And last but not least, just in alphabetical order, Sara Tischer from the Impact Investing Institute representing the UK. Before uh, moving forward, uh, I'd like to mention that uh, uh, also FAIR, uh, the French Nab, is, is part of, uh, of the consortium, but unfortunately, to a, due to a last minute uh, um, problem, they couldn't, they couldn't really attend. But, they're also part of this effort and uh, they will join future future activities. So this is a very brief uh, uh, small introduction of the agenda and what expects us today during the webinar. As you can see, this webinar is divided in three parts and each of them uh, includes an open discussions that starts from a statement. As the goal of this webinar is really to on one side, touch upon different topics that are highly debated in the ecosystem and linked to data harmonization and data collection. And at the same time, hear from first from the experts, from the speakers, and from their national expertise, what they think about the topic, and then uh, announce some open conversations with the audience. So it's not gonna be in a frontal lecture mode, we'd like to really engage with the audience and, and hear your views. I therefore encourage you to drop all your questions and opinions in the chat uh, using the chat function or the questions function that uh, should appear on, on your screen. And we will be happy to feed them into the discussion. One suggestion would be to direct, uh, if possible, the questions to the speakers and experts um, that, uh, that, are, that are with us today. Without uh, further ado, I'd like to present you again very briefly. Uh, I don't want to uh, lose, lose time or, or spend more time than needed before the discussion to present you a bit and set the scene and share the main highlights of this collaboration that is a first of its, uh, of its kind. So first of all, very briefly, I'd like to present the highlights in a timeline format. This is a timeline taken from our report Accelerating Impact, which is available online and you can always access at any time because it's freely downloadable. And uh, yeah, I, I'm back to 2020 where uh, this uh, uh, collaboration started. The, this collaboration was initiated by the Italian, the French, the German and the Spanish NAB with the aim of harmonizing the ways in which they were looking at data collection and market sizing in their, in their countries. And uh, uh, they invited EVPA and GSG to coordinate this effort. In, uh, uh, this was done in view of a, a session of the European Social uh, Entrepreneurship Summit organized by the European Commission that was supposed to be held in Mannheim in 2020, then COVID happened and it was postponed to 2021. But that was the moment in which this collaborative effort really gained momentum and GSG and EBPA got the clear mandate of coordinating this harmonization effort uh, in Europe. And at the same time, other NABs joined uh, this collaboration, like the Dutch NAB and the English NAB. 2022 was our, uh, let's say, highlights year, because it was the year in which we formally launched this consortium, and uh, that uh, has seen a lot of uh, national, uh, um, national uh, studies published, but most importantly, the, the, it was published the first 
uh, European Impact Investment Report uh, jointly with, with all the partners of the consortium that really attempted to provide the first estimate on European impact investing market. So we are very happy to, to be here today and uh, and keep on uh, keep on the conversation going because this was only the first attempt and we are now more motivated than than any than 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 in any time to keep on this this uh, this effort moving forward and we have uh, we are looking at 2023 as an opportunity to kind of regroup and structure a bit better this collaboration as well as work to facilitate the replication uh, in other world regions as well as uh, work on a common European impact investment uh, database. I'll uh, just uh, I'll leave the floor uh, in a second to, to, to my spelling partner Christina. Before that, I just want to uh, again thanks uh, all of all of the partners that made this first report, but also the whole uh, the whole effort possible. Because on top of uh, uh, the national advisory boards that are represented here today by the speakers. I want to mention also their academic partners and 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 other partners that are all uh, in this slide that were crucial in providing uh, support, knowledge, and uh, and uh, crucial resources to the to the deployment of uh, of this effort. So I'd like now to to leave the floor to Christina, who could tell us a bit more also the perspective from the GSG and why, why does she think that this effort is, is crucial? Thank you so much, Gianluca, and thank you everyone for being on this call. It's a real pleasure. Um, and actually, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure, but it's also because it's a really important topic. Uh, we, we may think that uh, measurement comes at the end, but actually it's, it's also the beginning. And that's why this work has been a really extraordinary effort uh, that was led by uh, so many people and so many uh, national advisory boards in Europe. Um, first of all, why it's important? Because it helps us measure progress. It helps us uh, really understand what's happening in the different countries, who are the players who are investing into impact, uh, but also helps us identify the gaps that we still need to address in our markets. Uh, secondly, and it's really a, a path towards comparison, being able to compare the different markets um, and, and you know, how uh, they are addressing uh, the, the specific needs around uh, social and environmental issues in their countries um, so that we can help uh, people and different stakeholders get inspired by each other. Uh, comparability is extremely important and, and this is really going in that direction. Um, the third is, is also in a way uh, enabling to create peer pressure uh, we have so many issues, so many challenges and the urgency to act. Um, this is also a way to enable acceleration of impact capital towards social and environmental impact. Um, because where do we want to get? And this is only one tool, but it's an extraordinary collaboration in that direction. Uh, we want to go in the direction of impact economies where impact is embedded in all decisions, financial, business, investment and policy decisions. And so this is helping uh, assess how well we are progressing towards that destination. And so I, I see this as, um, you know, kind of a first step. And we're really excited about working together to, to go forward and further uh, into, you know, uh, sizing the markets and understanding uh, all of the players that are investing into impact. This, this uh, study has been only on uh, direct impact investments and we want to look at how we can enlarge and improve this work. Um, the replication of it uh, is already being discussed for, and thanks Gianluca for mentioning it, uh, for, for Latin America, but also potentially in other regions of the world. Um, so it's really concrete and it's a way uh, that is bottom-up. So it's, it's a bottom-up approach where uh, the local stakeholders are coming together to define uh, what makes sense, what matters, what is impact, and all of the, the different uh, contributions that the investors are making, negative and positive. And this really helps progress the discussions and the consensus around where we want to go and what we want to see. So, so it's extremely exciting and uh, uh, we, we are presenting this to you as, as one, uh, one result, but we are definitely all of us committed to, to, to going further and collaborating further um, on, on, this, uh, on this topic. 
back thank over you very to you. Much. Thank you very much, Christina. And uh, let me let me just stress that uh, I think this is this is a very important effort, but also an important year because uh, last year was the year of our joint data collection. We're planning the new study in 2024, so this is the year to really collect insights, to collect uh, information from other organizations that can join this effort and can help us refine a bit what has been done the first way. And uh, it's also here for for debate, for discussion, and that's why we're having this this webinar. And last but not least, it's, it's a here also to share learnings because we are about to launch our uh, blog post series that is done uh, uh, in co coordinated again by VPHSG, but really, really much with all the partners in the lead. Uh, we are launching today the first piece of this blog post, and we're really excited to be uh, somehow a megaphone of what are the best practices at national level that are worth skating at, at European level and in the future globally as well. So uh, without further ado, I think it's time to uh, turn on some, some discussions and time for, for, for the debate. So here is the first uh, statement that is uh, around the topic of additionality. So as you can see on the screen, we believe that the impact investing definition should go beyond uh, the intention to generate a measurable social and or environmental impact, but actually include an explicit mention to investor additionality, which aims to generate an impact that would have not happened otherwise. So it kind of claims for uh, the inclusion of additionality into the definition of, of impact investing. Uh, I'd like now to ask uh, these uh, four speakers in the slides to uh, comment this sentence, bring in their uh, experience from, from their countries in a short and concise uh, manner if possible. Uh, Filippo, over, over to you. Well, thank you, Gianluca, for, for having me and having this opportunity to uh, share thoughts around uh, such a bold but and challenging uh, statement. But at the same time, I think also a very necessary uh, statement. Uh, in my view, investor additionality is key to the definition of impact investing if we would like to be serious with impact and with SDG um, achievement. Um, I, I feel that we, we need to ensure that impact investments are really making a difference, for example, against SDG targets, and also to be really additional uh, not only financially, but also in terms of, of outcomes, of positive outcomes that investments are able to, 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 to generate. And we also need to ensure that impact investing is not diverting both financial and non-financial resources. Uh, think of, for example, uh, public spending or uh, welfare services. So we need impact investing as a way of mobilizing uh, further capital. But also we need to pay attention not to uh, either displays outputs or outcomes from a stakeholder group to another one, and also to minimize all the risk of uh, crowd crowding out uh, other investments. Um, so I, I think it's crucial, it's, it's very important to understand and optimize how uh, investments are able to expand outputs or outcomes uh, to provide them at a larger scale or to uh, provide them in a quicker way or to uh, be able to include uh, those people and organizations that traditionally are excluded from, 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 from the markets. Uh, so we, we need uh, to integrate uh, additionality in the investment decision-making processes and these means to apply concrete steps. This means to introduce in our investment companies uh, new methods, tools, processes, and also skills in order to understand and also to, to manage um, additionality uh, before and after uh, an investment. Um, so it requires also uh, quite much convergence on what we mean with additionality and on the methods to to measure and to manage uh, that concept. Uh, so these are some first thoughts around uh, additionality. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Filippo. And uh, I see some some questions already dropped. So please keep on dropping your questions. I, now I'd like to hear from from Frederick and and from from Belgium. What's your perspective on on this sentence? Yeah, thank you, Gianluca. Um, are you turning on my microphone? Does this work? Wonderful. I can hear you well. Yeah, I can. Wonderful, it. wonderful. So, so thank you, Filippo. Um, and of course, I was sort of marking. We didn't know what the others would tell, and, and not surprisingly, there is there is some overlap. Um, but that's a that's a good sign. Um, but let me let me run through the the remarks. Um, I told it down. I do think it's really important to look at the investor additionality. That's what I uh, I brought in there. There's a big bit of confusion as to what additionality means to different people. But I, I first want to start with the word impacts. As we, at least, I mean, we're, we're sort of preaching to the converted here. We all have a very exciting uh, view about impacts that all we realize is sort of positive, non-financial, uh, environmental, social things. Uh, but in fact, obviously, everything we do has impacts. And, and a lot of it could be financial, it could be non-financial. It's ideally positive, but it, it's quite also negative, too. So to, to just like open that up, like the word impact in itself is already a confusing term and an impact investing. I think we're on a good track to to push it in the right direction. Uh, but that's where some of this confusion already starts. Um, I do think it's good that impact is very often associated with social and environmental outcomes. Um, but the ESG terminology has, has come about for a good reason. And I just wanted to stress the G part because governance is quite often forgotten about. And, and as a good old banker, I'm actually convinced that governance is almost even more important than the others if you really want to preserve your investments. Because if the governance is not good, your investment tends to go down, and then there's no impact at all. Um, but that's before we get to uh, to additionality. Um, now, any any form of um, uh, of finance, um, by definition, should almost look for impact. Any form of finance will look for the most efficient way of generating your outcome. When we think business terms, of course, and uh, and and. In, in doing so, you almost automatically generate impact. And I want to make that clear here that a lot of the companies out there, starting at my neighbors, but also internationally, are doing a lot of good things. They generate jobs, they generate tax revenues, they generate social outcomes, they generate environmental outcomes, but that doesn't make them impact investors. To just make, make that point uh, that we have to be very careful about what we actually include in impact. And, and I dotted this down as impact for most investors is what I call, maybe not very uh, academically, a bycatch. It's sort of a side product. But as I mean, it's going to be our goal here to see if we can increase that side products and, and maybe ma even make it the main products of, of investors. And then you get very quickly to the point of additionality. Um, but, but to just be very aware of this. Um, on the definition side, I've seen all kinds of definitions that typically start also in your uh, expose here with intentionality. Um, some include the materiality, um, and that's where, where a third or fourth is typically additionality. I think additionality, and this is based on many years of development finance, uh, should be very focused on the financier, not necessarily on your outcome, but on your own role. And this is overlaps with what Filippo already said, it linked to words of crowding out. You're only additional if what you do really contributes something to the market that otherwise would not have been realized. And I don't think it's actually very hard to pose that question. And I know most bankers don't pose that question. They look at the securities, they look at the outcomes, they look at the ROIs, et cetera, et cetera. But very few of them actually pose that question like, what is my role here and what would happen if I would not pick up that role? And, and to me, that's the core of additionality. Just pose the opposite question. If I weren't there, what would happen? Because that's the, the easiest litmus, litmus test to see if others would be using their funding and, and uh, potentially you're hitting a crowding out situation. Um, and the trick part there is, of course, like what answer is acceptable? Because the reality is never that black and white. Um, in some cases, yes, you can, you can generate wonderful impacts and you have a good story about it, but quite often there's that gray zone. And I think that we as a community can help there as well to see like how in that gray zone can we provide more clarity? Because a lot of the impact is not that you're just doing something that would never have been done before, but we do it faster. We do it differently. We, we aim for different 
uh, could be social uh, groups, uh, different beneficiaries, um, and, and we can play an example role in what we do. Um, so so there, there are different aspects to additionality, and I do think that we as a group could get together on this to provide more of this clarity, because over the, the past many years, I've seen tons of different answers that people make up sort of ad hoc and that some credit committees uh, accept or not, uh, but there is no clear common language on this. And, um, and I think we, we would all quickly agree that yes, additionality is important, but the trick is then what is included here and what is new and innovative enough or what is sooner, better, larger than it otherwise would have been. Um, and that's a, a question where we can provide guidance. We'll never provide the perfect answer with five star asterisks, uh, but we can provide guidance and it's up to, I would say all the investment officers or whatever the, the terms used at, at the different financial institutions and their credit committees to actually think about this. And in the ideal situation, to also write this down, report this and, uh, and show it afterwards. Uh, but that's where anyway, impact and additionality, I think quite often misses that window of, of the reporting and the auditing the way we're used to doing for the financials. If we would have that very same approach for the non-financials, we would get very far. Um, so I totally support the statement here. And I do think that we as a community can help uh, to make this better. So I'm looking forward to next meetings with, uh, with all the experts here, because I don't think it's that hard to provide that guidance, but I'm looking forward to also inputs from uh, next speakers. Thank you very much, Frederick. Now, uh, without commenting, I'd like to give the floor to Sara because I'm really happy to hear what, what she be saying to us. Well, thank you for that introduction, Gianluca, and thank you, Filippo and Frederick, for your starter comments, as well as consensus on the panel. I think I will be bringing um, a bit of, I, I guess, build or a different perspective. So I wanted just to talk about investor additionality as a useful philosophical concept in impact investing. Um, but for us at the Impact Investing Institute with a UK National Advisory Board on Impact Investing, there are four key reasons why codifying it as a term might not be helpful as in building it into the definition and why we believe that detailing investor contribution might be a more practical better way of kind of getting to the same end so just to say firstly i completely agree with what filippo and frederick have said in terms of you know the whole point of doing this work is um, of adding all of this impact webbing around an investment strategy is to have a better result on society. So we really think that everything that we're doing needs to add up to a better result for people and planet. So kind of conceptually, we're aligned with the idea that this should do more good than otherwise would have happened um, using a completely um, non-impact orientated um, investment approach. So we are in the same camp philosophically, but it's actually the practical work through where we differ. And I just wanted to walk through the four reasons why we find additionality as a concept somewhat constraining and unhelpful. So the first thing um, is that it means different things to different people. And the classic division around how people use additionality is, first of all, some people mean it as incremental capital allocation. So money that wasn't being invested in an organization is now invested in an organization. But other people also use it in that other way, which is to say, oh, the outcome is better than that which would have otherwise happened. So those are two very different approaches to what additionality means. So step one there's a sort of issue problem with the term additionality there's not consensus on what it is step reason number two why we find it unhelpful is that if you take particularly if you take the incremental capital allocation meaning of additionality it really rules out any public markets activity which i know we're going to get to in panel two so it basically says that if you're in P markets and you can clearly say, well, I've allocated a new chunk of capital to new enterprise X, then um, that's a kind of contributing additionality. But we at the Institute believe in impact in public markets. We believe that there are 
all sorts of ways in which you can push enlisted markets for change, um, particularly really, really toothy stewardship. So I think additionality can sometimes rule out um, public markets. Point three, it's almost impossible to evidence. So maybe these are all problems we can solve. So that's another question, but it's almost impossible to evidence. So if you take the incremental capital allocation, if you're in private markets, you say, listen, well, I just put 10 million in that, that otherwise wouldn't have been there. But you can't tell me that if you hadn't been there, that someone else wouldn't have been there. And so even on the incremental capital side, where you would think it's really clear, it's not clear from a systems perspective. And then more broadly on the counterfactual, what would have happened if I hadn't invested in this way? There's no simple, clear way to evidence that counterfactual systematically. I think it is a good question for an investor to ask of themselves. Have we left impact on the table in the way that we're doing this work? Have we, um, do we think that this is the, the best way of optimizing for impact? You know, it's a sort of, a process question but for me it shouldn't be right front and center definitionally and the fourth reason why it's unhelpful is because while this is all super important at let's say the asset manager asset owner level from a policy making level it's a very hard one for regulators and policy makers to police and hold accountable and we're seeing that for example in the UK we have our financial conduct authorities, the sustainable, uh, sustainability disclosure requirements, which are going to be um, consumer facing disclosure requirements on products. One of the things that they were looking for is um, uh, whether this kind of additionality point can come through. And if there's not a good way of evidencing for it, then it's very hard to police. So those are our four reasons why additionality doesn't why we align behind the gin definition and why additionality for us doesn't sit in that core definition of impact investing notwithstanding that is an incredibly important intellectual idea and just to close close off because I, I already feel like I've veered over my three minutes for us we are quite practical people at the institute and I think for us we think about investor contribution which actually really builds on what Frederick said um, and this is what we reflected in our sustainability disclosures requirement consultation response. So how can an investor articulate what it is doing? What is its theory of change in entering into this investment? What does it clearly see as the additional elements that it is adding to the underlying investments? And then still committing to the ultimate impact um, the, the measurement of the ultimate impact of those measurements, but not getting too much in a, um, not getting too bound up in trying to evidence the fact that this strategy was more additional than the other strategy that wasn't used because that's so hard to articulate in evidence. So I'll just end my point there. We think additionally, additionality, um, important concept, practically very hard to implement. So we favor um, detailing investor contribution because that keeps public markets open and is a uh, is something that we can clearly evidence as a field right right now today thank you very much sarah for uh, for elaborating that you touched upon already some some elements of the second topic and i know you have a hard cut suit but uh, but yeah thank you very much for for your contribution i think uh, it, it's an example of like a, a debate we can generate because philosophically we are all aligned, but we it's a time to debate like how do we get there. Now I'm really happy to leave the floor to Marta for uh, her view as well from from Spain, as I know they've been doing some some great work on additionality as well. Ah, uh, thank you, Gianluca, and thank you for the opportunity to to speak about the Spain NAB experience in in impact investing understanding and. Well, and the use of this uh, impact investing definitions, definition in, in the market sizing and segmentation efforts that we've been making. Um, and thank you also to, to my previous colleagues for the statements. Uh, I would say that, that we in Spain we are kind of in the middle of, of, of both. So well, I, I, I took both parts as, as with some agreements, I, I would say. And, and I love to comment on this specific ele element of impact investing uh, definition because uh, additionality, we believe, is a fundamental pillar of impact investing. 
but still uh, it is very controversial as this has already been said and very complex issue so uh, for this reason um, this is why Spain NAP uh, we have conducted um, <coughs> sorry several sessions uh, last year uh, with our tax force our funds tax force where we gather more than 30 entities uh, from well, mostly asset managers but also other other type of, of uh, supply side actors and intermediaries and we um, we dedicated the most of the sessions that we had last year uh, to to well to have a common understanding of impact investing and that led us to focus on analyzing additionality and realizing that um, there are different types of, of different types of, of additionality and different sources of additionality to be considered that should be considered um, in order to identify and segment impact investing and that's why um, having this in mind we we um, we follow the finally we, we look for different frameworks and finally we we follow the the impact management project which is a global consensus and we studied separately the contribution that uh, the asset and the investor has uh, in an investment so uh, we studied those as, as two different sources of possible of a possible contribution uh, or of a possible outcome that would not have happened otherwise uh, so meaning that they are like two separate uh, different ways of an investment to generate uh, additionality and um, the, the, the results of this analysis of the conclusion of, of this analysis and the consensus we we managed to together is that on the one hand uh, an impact investment um, should always be invested in additional companies or projects and by that we, we mean that uh, as frederick said investing in companies that have good impact good impact is not impact investing because uh, almost any project or any or any company could have good impacts um, but um, we use for for identifying um, additional or, or additional contribution uh, projects or, or, or companies, the five dimensions of impact, also a framework of the impact management project. And um, so um, this is useful to identify uh, the investees or the or the uh, underlying in, in a portfolio that uh, should deliver in an impact investing should deliver relevant solutions to social and environmental challenges where the target population or the stakeholders to receive this this uh, this service or product are unattended uh, and that the product or the service provides a probable outcome of uh, that is better than would what what than would what have happened uh, otherwise so uh we believe that this should always be in in in, in the in an impact investing and on the other hand impact uh, or investor contribution is not always additional um, although we believe that it's good to pursue you uh, that the role of the of the investor should uh, also uh, uh, be additional uh, because in, there are many challenges that cannot be resolved if if, if, if if the investor is not is not additional as when you go to uh, when you when you um, need flexible capital or when you um, uh, operate to open new markets or underserved markets of capital but uh, what we as the IMP also recognizes other kinds of contributions such as uh, signaling that, that impact matters that would be very uh, for instance very very common in, in public markets um, we have to segment impact investing uh, taking into consideration when investors uh, additionality comes into play so uh, at, uh, at this moment, we will call uh, impact investing additional impact investing. So I don't know if it's kind of a, of a framework to, to try to, to, to dig into, into these uh, nuances in, in additionality that could help uh, investors to differentiate uh, where to put their money. Definitely, and I think that ties very well with what what Sarah mentioned about detailing a bit better investor contribution. So, I think I think uh, again th there is overall alignment, but uh, but it's interesting that we are all committed to to get there, and uh, and there are different ways and different strategies we can adopt. Before moving to the to the second topic, I'd just like to first of all thank all of you that that dropped some remarks in the chat. They've been well noted. There is one question that I'd like to throw to the panel before we move on. And I don't know who wants to take it because it's kind of a Pandora box, but they're asking whether uh, the SFDR articles 8 and 9 are helpful for investor additionality or more of, a, of an hindrance. 
would like to volunteer on that. Marta. Um, I would say that it, it has nothing to do with additionality. This, this uh, articles eight and nine, they are uh, talking about sustainability investments. Uh, so they don't put in place at all uh, the pillars of impact investing. And that's one of our claims from Spain that we will we would like to have a special article for impact investing because uh, in, right now we don't have that. And there are a lot of confusion and article lines are, are um, many times confused with uh, impact investing, but you can be an impact investor and, and classify yourself as nine because it's like the most sustainable product within the SFDR, but it doesn't imply, uh, I mean, you can be an, an investor and a sustainable product and, and be an article line at the same time. So Jan well, Luca, I, I might come in if I'm if I may. Um just to um just as a build on the article eight, article nine discussion, as I referenced in my opening remarks around the sustainability disclosure requirements, something that's being proposed on this side um, of the pond is uh one of the labels that's being proposed as a sustainable impact label, and that is aspiring to kind of frame and categorize. Um, an impact investing approach um, and I believe one of the things that we're working on at the Institute and you know would love to continue to work on with European colleagues is thinking about and, and an issue that's raised by asset management here in the City of London is the interoperability of these systems, the SFDR systems, the um, sustainability disclosure requirements here, ultimately the ISSB. So I think that the for me the basics of impact investing are always the same. This intention, the measurability, really having a well-articulated strategy that you evidence how you're performing against that that through line um, still stands. It's more that we still haven't got the regulatory and policy framework that really is able to, to recognize and hold people accountable to that. Um, but we're in a, a kind of policy flourishing at the moment. And I think this stuff is all being worked through and everyone on this call in their separate markets is is kind of working the stuff through together. Um, but I, I completely agree with Marta's analysis. I see. Yeah, I, I saw Filippo first wanted to, to intervene and then Frederick, I'll, I'll leave you the word. Well, uh, just to reiterate what uh, Sarah just said, and I also agree very much with uh, with, with with Marta. Uh, perhaps I would uh, further stress that at least for the European approach, uh, the, the the scope is quite is quite different. So I, I think now the challenge is to make uh, the different scopes of the regulatory frameworks uh, being able to uh, support the development of impact investing. Uh, so specifically. On additionality, I think Article 8 or 9 wouldn't add anything relevant, but more in general, I think we need to find the good synergies with the SFDR um, implications. Uh, so I, I think there is still a space for adaptation and for improvement. I mean, every uh, uh, quarter we, we have some updates on the interpretation and on the technical um, references for for the application uh, of SFDR so I think we still have some some space of manner for supporting impact investing in this uh, landscape Frederick would you like to conclude with a yeah it's just a very short notion to make the distinction between public or publicly supported funding versus private funding I think additionality is a lot more important for any public funding or publicly supported funding and, and if it's private entities doing good things in the Article 9 or better, that's wonderful. Then, it, then I have far less of an issue with additionality. To me, that's really a thing where public funding is being used, um, where you have to be extra careful on the additionality part. Thanks. Christina, uh, yeah, sorry, Sara. Do you want to? Janlika, I would love, before I have to peel off, I would love to say a couple of things about listed markets before I have to leave before the second panel but I don't know if now's the right moment. Definitely I'll leave maybe the floor to Christina just for a very quick introduction of, of the second but then I'll, uh, she can leave you the floor right after she introduces the sentence. 
Yeah, thanks. I hope you have a couple of minutes, Sarah, and I uh, would love to hear from you, actually. Um, yeah, so, I mean, let's let's go to the, the next, uh, what I would call the next frontier uh, for this work, is really to look at what does impact look like uh, for public markets. Um, it's a huge opportunity to drive significantly more capital towards social and environmental impact. Uh, most of the mainstream uh, finance uh, is in uh, listed uh, equities and in public markets. So how do we get those investors uh, to really care about creating measurable social and environmental positive social and environmental impact? Um, so, so I think that that's really uh, the, the next step is to include that into our work and into our conversations. Um, before before going into this specific statement, I just want to to highlight and to uh, kind of uh, yeah highlight the work, the excellent work that's been done very recently uh, by the GIN. Uh, so they uh, published something. Uh, it's a it's a guide for investors on pursuing impact in listed equities. So it's a really excellent uh, kind of support to kind of think about these dimensions. Uh, around data, around the relationship between uh, the investors and, and uh, the investees, uh, around the, the, the importance and the role of uh, the, uh, the, the rating agencies and so on. So there is, there is really a, a good number of people who are already starting to think about it. And I also want to mention the work um, that uh, uh, impact frontiers and pre-distribution initiative are doing on, on investor contribution. So they are really, uh, and, it's, and it's a wonderful bridge actually between statement one and statement two uh, to highlight that, um, you know, investor contribution negative and positive uh, on, on the different asset classes is where we need to push uh, the conversations and the boundaries. Um, they have released already for consultation uh, investor contribution metrics uh, for uh, private investments. So uh, that's already there. So recommend uh, that you go there. Uh, it's on the Impact Frontiers website. Please provide feedback uh, because that's really what, what we need to look at and implement. And then they are already also working on, on the concept of public assets. If you haven't seen it, uh, it's based on a, a report and a, a white paper that was published by the Impact Management Project and Pre-Distribution Initiative in September 21, looking at detailing a suggested draft of negative investor contribution. Uh, so if you are interested in it, I, I encourage you to look at it. Uh, it's available on the Impact Frontier uh, website, uh, you know, alongside uh, the, the current uh, kind of work that is being uh, up for consultation. And so, so I think really uh, just, I mean, Highlighting this work that is happening, we will draw from it, we will include more collaborations in this next phase of work uh, and, and also highlight the fact that, uh, yes, I mean, public markets, next frontier, uh, some of the tools there are very promising. So, for example, the green social and sustainability uh, bonds are a really interesting instrument that we can use uh, for impact in public markets. Uh, in, in they have been growing 80%, uh, sorry, yes, 80%, no, that's a real number, the 80% year on year uh, since a couple of, uh, in the past 10 years. So it's, it's a really important growth and uh, reaching uh, 700 billion in 2021, it is growing significantly. And within that realm, uh, well, first of all, if we use that better and use impact much better, and measurement better, we can create more uh, capital flows towards impact. And the second thing is that within that realm of tools, sustainability linked bonds and sustainability linked um, loans are a great tool already that are aligned uh, with our thinking about, uh, you know, paying for results and investing into outcomes, um, which will, uh, if, uh, you know, everything goes well and our GSG predictions uh, and analysis uh, come true in 2023, they will outgrow the issuance of all of, of the green bonds. So very interesting. Uh, I, I just wanted to make this introduction before going into the discussion around the statement here and hearing from all of you, starting with Sarah, 
So the statement, agreeing on a well-defined set of criteria that can describe what makes investing in listed companies and publicly traded bonds impact investing, is a crucial step to expand the reach of the impact movement while maintaining the impact integrity of the ecosystem. So really looking forward to hearing from you, Sarah, before you have to leave. Um, that's so kind, Christina, and sorry for um, leaving directly after this. I love this question. I'm so glad that you've raised it. And I wanted just to, to touch on three examples that I think if we're not considering them as part of the impact investing universe, because we're ruling out public markets, it highlights how crazy that is. <laughs> So one is, um, and they're, they're just th they're just three completely random examples. So one is um, Aris Egg Partners. It's a boutique global south investor. It takes long term holds in um, companies in emerging and developing uh, countries. It buys um, listed equities. It puts so much thought, care, and attention. It has detailed measurement and reporting approaches, and works really closely with the management there to to ensure that those impacts are made i don't see why that approach that thoughtful detailed impact-led approach will be playing through in a listed equity market focused on clear SDGs does not comprise this addressable universe if we're if we're not in public markets in the uk we have a, a foundation called the friends provident foundation who are real a uh, big uh, f first mover in endowments with impact they delivered this really detailed, targeted engagement strategy in their um, uh, in their listed investments, looking at encouraging utility companies to advance the just transition. And they asked their holdings to um, to detail out just transition strategies. The underlying companies um, have then committed, for example, SSE, which is a major utility company here in the UK. And as a result of that engagement that was intended, that went in with that strategy, that used that underlying investment to secure that outcome, now not only is that company transitioning to net zero, but it's doing so in such a way that's sensitive to its workers, to reskilling, to local communities, to places. That's using your public markets approach, combining it with your impact goal to deliver, to, to deliver change. And just to kind of close on Christina's really important point about the, the growth in green social sustainability linked bonds, you know, we've we've got to get our arms around this world so that we can bring the rigor to it that's married with the investor interest. And we in this side in the in the UK, we uh, led with a consortium of others in the UK. Um, we encouraged the UK government to issue green gilts with reported social co-benefits. Um, which that was work done in 2021. And, and ultimately, that has yielded the UK government um, issuing £16 billion worth of green gilts with reported social co-benefits. Again, you know, it's not the deep, deep impact of a loan to a charity, but it is capital that's now going to green projects in the UK where they're accounting for and reflecting on jobs, places, indices of multiple deprivation. Um, so I just, those are my parting thoughts because frustratingly I have to go and I, I wish I could hear other colleagues, but just to say that I really, we at the Institute would just love to see the thoughtful, brilliant people in this community start to think instead of our listed markets part of this world, to flip the question and say, how do we make listed markets part of this world with credibility, with authenticity, with integrity, and really bring them into in, 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 into our universe and I, I um, anyway so I now have to go but I really appreciate this call Christina I, I, I endorse the references that you've said as well the gin guide is excellent um, and sorry I can't be here to, to, to hear questions and other comments so <laughs> thanks for letting me pontificate thank you so much Sarah for jumping also into this question because your work at the Impact Investment Institute has been really uh, yeah I would say pioneering on this topic um, thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Um, handing over to, to you, Johannes, what's your, what's your perspective in Germany? Uh, what do your members in the, in the National Advisory Board think? 
Okay, first of all, thanks for having me in this excellent session. Um, I already learned a lot um, about additionality, and I couldn't agree more on, on, on what Sarah said. Um, I think the question of listed equities and bonds is one of the crucial questions uh, with regard to impact investing. And um, I think that Jin um, made clear up from the beginning that impact investing is possible in all asset classes. I mean, this is one of the characteristics of impact investing. And they did an excellent job in, in their guidance uh, that they published and they touched upon the important points, engagement, strategy, data. So um, I think we we're on a good way um, to, to, to bring this into the impact world and to get more clarity on what, what could be impact investing and what not. Um, I would love to take a little bit different perspective and this is maybe coming from a kind of German perspective you know Germany is based is there's a strong industrial base in Germany and the key question in the political sphere is how can we transform this whole industry into a green or blue or whatever economy um, so the question is more so I would I would argue we cannot ignore uh, public markets in this whole discussion. The question is how can we bring it in and how can we um, develop uh, an impact investing strategy in public markets. Um, otherwise we won't be able to create the change we need in the world. So we cannot only rely on private markets, we have to bring public markets in. So the question is not whether public markets are part of the impact discussion or the impact investing definition. The question is, how can we impact invest into public markets? So what do we have to do? How can we make engagement more efficient? How can we track, how can we create evidence? What the role of the investor was? How can we refine or define our strategies as an, as an investor in, in, in public markets? So um, I, think, I think that's the important question um, and we cannot ignore public markets. Uh, one final point. Um, I think in this whole discussion around uh, public equities, it becomes clear that impact investing has to be seen as a practice. It's not an impact investment, it's impact investing. So the way we invest, the way our strategy is, the, the question how we how the exit is, the, the question how we integrate impact in the whole investment process is crucial for impact. Uh, investing. It's not only the target that we have, it's not only the investment opportunity, the stock or the private equity deal or the bond. The question is how do we approach it? What would, do we want to achieve? What is our strategy? What is our intentionality? Um, and th I think that that's a very important point in this whole discussion that we see impact investing as a practice that we can also apply to public markets. Thanks, Johannes. I think that's a really great point, and 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 it it comes also to the to the you know it starts with strategy, but it's also about culture and mindset, and that's a huge huge uh, kind of change that we need to lead. Um, handing over to you, uh, Laure, uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, what's your perspective? You're working so much with pension funds uh, and and other institutional investors. Um, what, what's your view on this topic? So thank you very much. Thanks for uh, for the invitation and for uh, uh, for the possibility to uh, to have this conversation with uh, like-minded uh, colleagues from the NEBS and from EVPA. Um, so first of all, maybe one uh, initial remark is that you're saying that we are working so much with pension funds. Uh, in my view, totally not enough. And that's maybe my first point. Actually, uh, we don't want to be a niche market as impact investing. We want to be as inclusive as possible. Why? Because in, in any ecosystem, you need to have uh, all the different parts that are in balance with each other. And what starts uh, with the need of private funding today might be a growing organization in the future that will need an access to public uh, listed markets. So, you know, um, I think any ecosystem is not something that you measure at uh, in a single moment, but over a period of time and with different needs, uh, depending on that period of time. 
So if we want to build a harmonious impact investing ecosystem, we need to make sure that we include all the different pieces and uh, not remain a very exclusive niche market only on, um, uh, on, on private markets. And I think what was said a little bit earlier as well huh, about the fact that uh, you just need to, to do it with integrity. Well, I fully agree. And I think, you know, at the end, you might have different degrees of additionality depending on the type of financing that you uh, you bring uh, but you have to be transparent about it so what's your intention in the beginning how do you check that you do what you promise to do and how do you um, uh, how transparent are you about that and i think then anything is possible as long as you um, you are uh, true to your intention in the beginning and you are transparent about what this intention is and how you achieve it. The point that was made also by Johannes about the, the need for transitioning, we cannot imagine that we're going to solve the world's challenges only with new ideas. We need to transform the old economy. And I think, you know, one of the things that um, has happened recently in the Dutch market, uh, the largest uh, pension fund in the Netherlands, they are called ABP from the civil servants. Uh, actually, a year and a half ago, they announced that they would disengage from uh, the fossil uh, industry. But what's really interesting now is that they take their uh, thought process further and they announced recently that uh, the banks that finance the fossil industry had two years uh, to think about what their strategy was going to be. Otherwise, they would consider also disinvesting the banks. So I think, and, and these are all, uh, of course, uh, listed organizations. So that part of engagement can also have a huge impact on the transition towards a greener uh, economy and uh, better practices. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's what I want to say. My, my key message is really uh, we have to be inclusive and that has been said already many times. Uh, we have to think about um, all the different aspects of the ecosystem in terms of, of time and in terms of uh, different type of actors. Um, so that's it. Thank you so much, Laure. Uh, definitely. And, and being inclusive will get us uh, to... to more players and more investors are looking at impact in different ways and with different strategies. Uh, Frederic, what's your perspective from, from Belgium? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, for me, it's, it's hugely interesting to hear what's happening in Holland, what's happening in the UK, what's happening in other countries. And it, it, the, the lays of the land are, are quite different. And I really think we can we can learn from each other. And, and what Laura was just, just referring to, ABP, is, is a wonderful example also to us. Um, I recently actually talked to a group that sort of represents uh, pension funds here in Belgium and their approach, and then I have to say carefully, was fairly old school, uh, pointing at their fiduciary responsibilities uh, and, and all being careful and looking at the financial returns, which I fully understand. And I think we can go against it or we can try to understand and then see like what's behind this. And yes, there are regulatory aspects to it. And they can probably be improved and, and sort of structured in such a way that it opens up. And that's where the French obviously have a wonderful example uh, that we also want to see if we, we can copy in Belgium. Um, but most important, I think, is, is the voice of the investors and of, of the people who will be uh, benefiting from those pension data. I think it's surprising how in the financial sector, even all bankers barely know their own pension structures. I mean, think of each of you, how much you know about your private pensions. Where is that going? Where is that money going? We all care about impact financing. Do we look at our own pension funds and what they do? Probably not enough. And 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 so we have to think about, like, how, how can we approach this in a broader way? I totally agree with speakers before me who said this must be included simply for the sheer size. It must be included. Let's not try to only do new things. Let's try to change the existing economy. And there are wonderful examples out there. Um, now, when when you talk about this topic, I notice actually how black and white people react to it. Some are really sort of against anything listed. Um, and then typically additionality issues come in or uh, that we have no added value there. We're just replacing funding. 
um, that, that may sometimes be true, but if, if you look at a market of, of really big numbers, if you can change already three, five or 10 percent, that is huge and, and probably a learning step for, uh, for the future. So I would be really eager to see in the Belgian case how we can bring in pension funds uh, to do either to do more than they do now or to do it in a more visible way because sometimes they are doing good things but don't show it because of regulatory reasons they're very careful about showing this and that's where some of the article 8 9 discussions of what was it six months ago uh were, were not really helping um and, and and so i really want sort of want to cherish the good stuff that's happening already see how we can uh, we can build on this on the bond side uh, again, the Dutch, I, I saw different wonderful examples. We just heard Sarah talk about the UK as well, um, would really open up some of these institutional investors, the pension funds, the insurance companies. And um, and, and I think it's it's crucial if we want to show a scale, um, we, we simply need to uh, need to include these. Um, what I actually now noted down from Sarah, some of the examples where they're not just looking at financial contributions, but also non-financial contributions. I think that's a really interesting way. I don't know how at what large scale that can be done, but maybe small examples are really good. Um, to also express that impact financing is not just about money flows, but it's really how you do it and how you accompany and steer your investees. And, and my experience is that quite some of them are hungry for support that quite some of them want to do the best and, and then typically all the ESG topics come in uh, to improve their business and create more impacts, but they're also looking at the financiers how to do it. So we can help them and guide them in, in this as well. Um, so I, I am really eager to look at how we can open this up in Belgium. I'm really eager to see how examples outside Belgium uh, can help on this. And yes, to go back to the statements, and the statement actually starts on agreeing, and I think that's the easiest. We can always agree that we need to agree, uh, but it's that set of criteria that's going to be interesting where probably, again, we can learn from each other, like what criteria help, what tools can help um, to make sure that those listed companies or the publicly traded bonds can actually brought in in, in a reliable way that, that people appreciate, instead of having the situation that we're a little bit in now, that it's very easy to criticize it and get a very negative flavor around these topics. And, and therefore, you, therefore you forgo on, the, on all the positive inputs that this can have. And, and so again, I would love to, to look at the, the homework we should take on to, to help this, uh, this part of the, uh, the sector improve. And, and really good, put that to good use. And, and if you talk about putting money financing as a force for good, here is the huge potential. So I'm really eager to uh, to see what we can do in this space. Thanks, Frederick. Um, definitely. And and it's all about the details, right? So uh, it, it's going into the the different kinds of criteria, the different kinds of contributions, and and looking at uh, what good looks like and what, uh, you know, maybe some thresholds. And so anyways, lots of work to be done. Uh, Gianluca, I'm, I'm looking at you specifically. I'm not sure I'm seeing the chat, uh, if there are any interesting questions. So if you can uh, perhaps uh, highlight the questions that you think we should ask our panelists here for this Q&A session. Definitely. So I haven't I haven't seen questions, uh, let's say, drop, dropped in the in the chat, but I'm also aware of uh, of uh, a bit of, of timing. So um, I was uh, I was wondering, uh, Christine, is it fine for you if we move forward to the to the next topic, or would you like to to ask a question? No, to I, our I think we've, we've covered this one quite well. Uh, unless maybe Johannes or Hugh, yeah. if you have any any comments. I have one, maybe one final comment. Um, that, that came up. I think um, one of the questions or what, one of the challenges uh, with regard to listed equities and bonds is that uh, we are always talking about impact investing as one monolithic investment approach. Um, and we're very, talking about this thing very uh, undifferentiated. So I think we have to be a little bit more different. We have to bring more differentiation into this approach because I totally understand that people investing in a social enterprise, a venture capital investment in a social enterprise in undersupplied market, put into one basket with a listed equity uh, strategy uh, in Europe. Um, from the outside, it's very hard to explain that both should be impact investing. 
and it's one investment strategy. So I totally understand people coming from the venture capital sphere, from the social venture capital sphere, seeing the danger that people who are new in the space go into the space and say, okay, I want to do an impact investment. And I do the, the one that is where I have the less, uh, less risk and um, big upside uh, potential. Okay, I do a listed equity um, a strategy. And then money is flowing out of these more niche parts of the market. So I think we need a more differ differentiated idea of impact investing. Be it this idea of impact generating and impact aligned investing or the model we developed in Germany with a genuine impact investing approach, but then different other um, linked approaches and strategies uh, that make sure that we compare apples with apples and that not apples with oranges. Yeah, I think I think we agree on that one. Marta, I see you have come back on video. Is it because you would like to, to say something to, to conclude yes, on this? I, I'd love to add a comment or a, or a question, maybe, if we have the time. <laughs> um, it is because uh, I totally agree that uh, uh, public markets should be part of the of the impact investing, but we need to bring them in, as, as it was said before, uh, with uh, integrity. But um, what I, what I mean, with intentionality, so a theory of change, an additional portfolio maybe is like more concentrated one because you really need to find those solutions to, to the challenges and, and a, a, a better um, or, a, or a good uh, manage, uh, mes impact measurement and management approach, but uh, the gene is uh, already working, well, has already published the, the work on that. But uh, what I don't what I don't see is calling with, with what Johannes was just saying, calling impact investing to the uh, like transition in uh, industries or improvers, because for sure this is needed. And this is uh, also a change that is needs to, ha to happen and that a lot of um, uh, flows of money need to be put there. But I think it should, it should have its own name. I mean, as the FCA just, um, uh, well, recently published in the consultation of its investment, investment labels, they call it like uh, sustainable improvers. I think it, it, um, Sarah just mentioned it before. Um, I think this is like a type of sustainable investments that also should be uh, um, uh, encouraged, but uh, to call everything the same, I think it does not help to direct flows to uh, all the needs that uh, that are different. This is my 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 thoughts. <laughs> These are my thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Marta. But actually, uh, I'm taking the opportunity, Hugh, and uh, and you may, maybe haven't prepared for this question, but at least you can maybe touch a little bit on it. You're doing so much work on just transition, just transition finance challenge, and although it doesn't specifically answer all of the the, the points, Marta, that you were making. <laughs> Maybe it's an interesting uh, kind of conclusion to, to look at that uh, work that you are leading in the UK uh, and Gianluca before transitioning to the third uh, part of this, uh, this panel. Yeah, of course. Um, I can explain a little uh, um, sort of what both it is and our strategy behind it, or our thinking at least. Um, so we've been developing over the last year um, something we're calling the Just Transition Finance Challenge, uh, which so far has uh, just over 20 asset managers and owners signed up to, as founding participants to co-create with us um, a set of criteria uh, which we hope to take forward and well we make we will announce publicly in the summer but we, and we hope to take forward um, f after a piloting stage that's happening right now with a few a uh, few fund managers and um, take forward as uh, as the title suggests a challenge a challenge to the industry and a challenge to um, the investment community broadly to adopt impact within quite a specific uh, and yet broad category which is this this piece on just transition um, even Johannes touched on it perhaps in in regards to Germany th th with transitioning out of or transitioning a heavy manufacturing industry uh, our focus is, is is sort of very much the same but with a focus on uh, global south communities global south industries um, emerging markets and how do we catalyze and drive capital flows uh, towards a just transition <clears throat> in these regions um, that both pre historically been underserved, but also going forward are going to really uh, feel the worst effects of um, the, the sort of multiple climate um, challenges they'll face, but also need to be really at the table, we, we feel, uh, we believe, 
uh, in terms of the conversation and um and and sort of uh, all this I mean, we're welcome we welcome any any uh, yeah any thoughts from from friends in europe on on this because although we have uh, i suppose have helped to convene it it's also something we're very aware of that we are we sit in the uk and uh, this without um <clears throat> to some points that have been raised on culture and thought and intentionality we 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 don't wish to bake in the the same the same problems of it being uh, you know a global north country telling those in the global south how to do their own business um so we want to try and really empower those that are there uh, i suppose that's a, a a metric that we can't really exactly quantify but one that we we hope to nonetheless achieve which is empowerment of um capital providers and managers on the on the ground themselves um with this challenge thanks you um and and you know i think that the work that you're doing is really uh, an example <coughs> of this need that we all agree towards uh the um indissociability the the integration always of environment social and communities uh which are really important in all of these uh considerations uh well thank you so much everyone what i retain from this second part is uh again a lot of learning from each other uh countries uh you know i think that even in this one uh, we've we've learned from each other uh collaboration and uh, the commitment to you know do the work uh, for, forward uh, to bring in the mainstream and look at how uh, what does impact look like uh, in, in listed markets. Handing over back to you, Gianluca. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. And it's now time to dive into the last uh, sentence of piece of conversation, uh, which is about uh, and around mobilization of resources. Before I dive into the sentence, uh, I'd like to stress that uh, this effort, uh, as was mentioned uh, several times by our speakers, is really to provide clarity in the market and has the final aim of having a well-functioning impact capital market uh, where capital is flowing towards uh, where it's most needed. And we believe we play a role as those uh, uh, providing data about the market, um, about, about the, the functioning on the market and, and, and the mobilization of resources in general. So, the sentence uh, uh, touches upon two main elements of what uh, data sh should be to um, again to, to make the market function efficiently but also to further mobilize resources on one side it's important to provide clarity and distinguish between direct investors and indirect investors so those that are investing into social enterprises directly uh, with their with their financial resources and those that are actually investing into vehicles that then invest into enterprises because um, that, that's needed to avoid the double counting and maintain the integrity but on the other side data should also reflect the needs of the impact enterprises who are the one that receives the financial and non-financial support from the investors and generate the ultimate uh, impact on, on people and the planet so uh, this is a uh, this is what we <laughs> stated. It would be now great to to hear the perspectives of uh, Martha Lauren and Filippo and Andre Johannes. Martha, start with you. Yes, thank you. Well, um, to this regard, um, well, um, I have to say that well, Spain up would agree with with both both statements. Um, however. Mm, these are distinctions that um, we are working to develop, but currently we don't include them in, in the Spanish uh, impact market figures when we, pub when we publish our, um, our sizing and segmentation efforts of the market. Um, um, firstly, because well, regarding direct and indirect investments, we understand the different roles of investors. Uh, and we for sure believe that they should be separately recognized. Um, and at the same time, we, we believe that um, both should should be considered in the in the in the, in the total figure in the, in the in the sizing. But we we don't include indirect investments until now because uh, we want to avoid a double counting. And and to that to date, we don't have the means to this to do this distinction. So. Uh, we always prefer to be uh, rigorous and want public uh, data that can lead to misleading conclusions and so to a bigger number than what it really is. 
Um, nevertheless, we are already uh, in this year survey, we are already asking for indirect investment uh, information in our surveys. So this year, uh, we are not going to publish probably, but we are going to map the market and and start working with information we, we want to, to elaborate this data uh, so that eventually um, we might be ready to 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 add this these flows but avoiding this double accounting and and regarding the the the, the well the needs of the demand uh, it is important to highlight that uh, this year uh, for the first time in spain uh, we are in spain now we are leading a, a study on sizing and segmenting the demand side in order to really understand their needs and their the, the financing gap that 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 is that is already there and and uh, we are going to try to align both uh, uh, the supply uh, side and the demand side uh, so that we can uh, try to 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 overcome this, to this gap of, of financing and this is going to be the first study of its kind in Spain because we um, we are trying to include every type of, of uh, entity demanding impact capital. So uh, not, uh, we will go from social economy institutions to impact the startups, impact SM, SMEs, uh, and well, we will, we will <laughs> we are working on that. So uh, well, uh, we are on our, on our way to 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 have better data and better, better figures and to uh, provide a. A good analysis of not only quantitative but also qualitative of, of all these these informations um, that we are gathering from, from the market. Thanks, Marta. I think uh, there, there's a lot to learn there, and and we are also let's say trying to collaborate with Heavily to create more and more connections, not just at national level but at European level as well. So yeah, we're definitely committed to to build on on what you've been doing in in Spain. Yes, Laura, would you like to also comment on the on the statement? Yeah, um, thanks very much. So I, I think in the Netherlands we've um, uh, we've taken a very practical approach. Uh, we acknowledge that market sizing is being very precise in market sizing is something that is very difficult. And because there's not enough reported data to uh, really know exactly um, what it is uh, that uh, that you're analyzing. So we, uh, when we did our market sizing, we looked at the quantitative and the qualitative uh, aspects, and we actually uh, took our opinion was that the quantitative was important to have a baseline uh, to basically measure our progress over time, but what was more important was to keep the same methodology at the beginning and at the end so that you know you don't have any discrepancies to measure your progress so it's more to keep ourselves accountable um, for you know the the progress that we can realize as a, as a dutch ecosystem we really feel that the data is a it's it's a means it's not an end uh, so um it's it's useful but our aim is to really grow the impact market, is not to have more access to data uh, at the end. So that's why for us, the debate between direct and indirect, um, we made a decision um, different from, uh, from Spain. We decided to have direct and indirect in our research, but we communicate clearly what is what. So yes, we acknowledge there is a, a light risk of double counting, although when we looked at the portfolios, um, of the uh, organizations taking our survey, uh, we didn't feel that there was a huge double counting, but we acknowledge that there is that risk. We make it clear when we explain our methodology, but we also communicated on both numbers because we thought, okay, this is just, you know, these are all stakeholders uh, that are investing um, in impact. Uh, regarding the reflection of the, the needs of the impact enterprises, I think if you put that in relation to direct versus indirect, this is a non-debate for me because even the indirect will invest in a fund that will then invest directly in, in uh, the impact enterprises. So uh, that, that's a, that's a non-issue. Uh, um, what we find really important is to understand what is the mismatch between supply and demand of capital. So these impact enterprises uh, need to receive uh, funding, need to grow, and very often there's a mismatch between 
the ticket size or the type of um, uh, illiquid versus liquid uh, assets that the supply of capital can, can bring. And this is the core of the problem. That's why when we did our market sizing, so we looked at the quantitative aspects, but we also looked at the qualitative aspects. What are the barriers? What is creating that mismatch? And how can we, as uh, NAB in the Netherlands, help co-create the solutions to solve these barriers? So that, that was more the point on, on the Dutch side. Thank you very much, Laura, indeed that, uh, so the second point of the statement is, is, is really about that. So it's, uh, it's interesting also to hear your perspective on it. Uh, Filippo, do you want to provide us a bit of, uh, yes, thank you. Topic? And I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm very happy to participate in this webinar. It's very interesting and, and informative. I have been, I mean, learning from all uh, the panelists, and I was uh, uh, especially I was um, agreeing on what Laura uh, just said, and also in her previous uh, intervention in the in second round of, of of session because she referred to ecosystem, to harmonious uh, growth, and all of these I think um, connects with uh, with the, with this third statement. Uh, when we speak about uh, the in impact investing market working efficiently, what, what, what does efficient mean? Efficient is a, is a point of equilibrium and is what uh, Laura was referring between uh, supply and demand. And it's crucial in order to establish such, a, such an equilibrium in our ecosystem to engage with all the stakeholder groups. So the distinction between direct and indirect investor can be helpful from an analytical perspective, but from a more pragmatic uh, approach, uh, I mean, we need to, to work with, with, with all of them. And uh, we, 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 we don't need to create barriers between, uh, between the different stakeholder uh, groups. And uh, I think also that the statement uh, underscored a crucial part on data so we need data in order to take uh, informed decisions and we need data in order to achieve that equilibrium or those equilibria uh, because uh, cer certain times we focus on, on just one single equilibrium in the market but instead there might be several ones um, so uh, i mean i i think at least in in, in my view that that distinction between indirect and in, uh, in, uh, indirect investors could help us to avoid double counting but at the same time we need to acknowledge the key role of in, in indirect investments uh, since they represent a great leverage for market development and they also uh, provide us opportunities for engaging with investors that now are not currently they are not currently investing uh, for, for for impact so I think, for example, uh, funds of funds, they are uh, making impact investing easier for certain stakeholder groups, for certain uh, investors, by providing more uh, diversified, for example, portfolio or uh, larger, uh, larger uh, investment tickets. So, I mean, uh, that segment of the market is, is crucial for developing the market in a harmonious way with equilibrium. And uh, as for um, the work on, with impact enterprises, as the Italian Lab, we are really focusing on this issue uh, because we believe that here uh, lays uh, one of the sources of this imbalance, of this mismatch between uh, supply and demand. Uh, so we are trying to foster dialogue and collaboration uh, between the different stakeholder groups. And we are also trying to challenge investors in order to develop uh, financial instruments that are designed to cater the needs of impact entrepreneurs. At the same time, we are also aware that impact entrepreneurs need uh, further capacity. So it's not just to change the financial instruments, but it's also to improve their capacity of uh, financial management, entrepreneurial uh, approach, and also impact measurement. Uh, so we are trying to work with both sides of, uh, of, the, of the market.
Thank you very much, Filippo, for bringing in your, your perspective from, from, from Italy. Johannes, uh, would you like to conclude this round? I can comments? keep it very short. Thanks. Um, in Germany, we're also very pragmatic. I'm more on, on, on Lore's uh, side. Um, I think double counting is a problem, um, but there are also a lot of other problems in these market studies, I think. Uh, uh, a lot of problems regarding the sample that we use. Um, is there consistency over the years? I mean, um, gin, the gin has got the same problem. They move towards market sizing. Is this better or worse? I don't know. There are pros and cons for, for each approach. Uh, I think we have to work on the double counting, but we have to work on a lot of different other other things that are that are out there. Um, and regarding the, the question of, of the companies and the needs of the companies, I totally agree that we have to focus more on, um, on the demand side of capital. Um, what we did a lot, and I'm not sure um, if there was an, in, an imbalance between the different approaches. We, I think we did a lot in order to mobilize capital and crowd in capital. We developed different structures where we said, okay, we have to guarantee those investors the same returns as in a classical investment. We have to buffer the risk and so on and so forth. So we very much focused on the needs of, uh, of the investing, investor, investor world in order to bring in more money. And maybe we have to kind of rebalance it and, and look more into the world of the, of the entrepreneurs. And maybe the investors have to transform and change their investment models, their return expectations, their investment horizons in order to fit the needs of the uh, of the investees. Um, yeah, that's it. But that's very very important uh, final remark, I think, Johannes, because um, that's indeed what what we'd like to do more because we have. Uh, you know, starting with this pilot, focusing more on the supply side of capital, but we believe there has to be a link with the, the demand. So starting from examples and national level, we can see what are best practices to involve them. I see you, he's, uh, he's raising his hand for a concluding remarks before we we close the webinar. You. Yeah, sorry, I've given myself a weighty task of concluding remarks. I didn't mean it. It was it was more to add to on the demand side of, of conversations and to refer back to the, the just transition challenge that um, Christine asked me to talk on is that we uh, bake into that or we try to bake into that considerations of community voice and socioeconomic distribution and equity uh, as well as climate um, and environmental uh, financing. So the community voice, I suppose, it goes right to the heart of to this second point and uh, it can be both the needs of the enterprises themselves as the community where the capital is um, being directed but it can also be those service who who that enterprise services you know the needs of and i think that's a really maybe helpful uh, or, or hopeful next the sort of next progression thank you you for uh for your your perspective uh i also am aware of time and i know we have two only two minutes left so I think it's uh, it's time to to move to uh, the conclusions. So uh, thank you all very much for uh, taking the time to to join the webinar. Before I leave for the last words of Christina, I would just like to remind all the audience that and the participants that they can access. There is a podcast on harmonization with me, my colleague Alessia, and a colleague of of Christina Raffaella talking about this harmonization effort. is available on Spotify and. As of today, we also have our first blog post uh, of the uh, Talking Numbers blog post series, uh, Scaling Impact Practices, featuring uh, Frederick and, and Seven from Belgium. So you can uh, you can access them uh, with the QR codes. And uh, yeah, Christina, leave it to you just for a final word before I end the webinar. But thank you all for coming. It was very, very insightful. Yeah, thank you. I mean, very short words to say thank you to everyone who came today, uh, the audience, but also uh, the, the panelists. Uh, and I mean, this is not just a panel, it's just discussing how we can go forward with this work. So we are very, very excited that we got so far and we created this uh, outstanding result. Uh, but I think everyone uh, knows and has understood that we have so much more to do. 
a lot of uh, detailed work uh, to, to go much further in, in this topic. In the end, what we want to, to know much better is uh, how much money is going and uh, to create what kinds of, of social and environmental impact. So um, looking forward to the next steps and to seeing you at different points in time this year. Thank you very much, everyone, and see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. That's pretty excellent moderation. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Sorry about my camera issues. <laughs> Don't worry. Okay, and I, I'm not sure how to get out of this.